from the Sven Nys Cycling Center in Baal, Belgium. Welcome, Welcome to, to the GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show. This week we discuss whether it's about time cycling called time on podium girls, plus another twit is caught using a motor in a bicycle race. Slightly less controversial though, we have new bikes, lights and brakes in Tech of the Week. Plus we also tell you exactly how less pressure helped Wout van Aert trounce Matthew van der Poel at the Cyclocross World Championships. Nothing to do with less pressure was it? It was just way better. Well way better and then there's this less pressure thing. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that winter commuting, even in places that have proper winters, is gaining momentum. The annual winter bike to work day in Chicago was bigger than ever this year, although it's not that surprising given that participants appear to gather in a park and eat cheesecake. I think cheesecake would get more people on bikes full stop yeah. then, honestly. Now we also learned this week that if you're in San Francisco, you can find yourself an Uber, but then you might have to pedal it afterwards. More on that later on. We also learned this week that cycling is a little bit behind the times. And it's not just this new poster from cobbled classic Kuhner of Brussels Kuhner, which depicts a Napoleonic Peter Sagan wearing white tights. Which are now technically cool, remember? Or at least maybe just fashionable. Anyway, the sports this week, sports of darts and Formula One, have been hitting the headlines. The reason being that they've both decided to abolish glamour girls, in the case of darts, who escort the players onto the pitch. Okay. No darts. And then Formula One, who have got rid of grid girls who stand and hold umbrellas over the top of the drivers, amongst other duties. Hmm. Now, most, of course, welcome this news, but there were a few people who claimed that this was political correctness gone mad, and others, including former grid girls, even claimed that this was anti feminist in that you are preventing certain women from doing the job that they really want to do. Yeah, we did a quick bit of research, and it seems like. MotoGP will still have grid girls in 2018. NFL will still have cheerleaders. Boxing will still have ring girls. And then of course, there is professional cycling. Well, cycling in general, men's and unbelievably women's who still have podium girls. So, is it about time that cycling joined the likes of Formula One, not to mention the 21st century, and called a ban on all podium girls at all races? Yeah. I mean, you'd think so, yeah. wouldn't you? To be fair, some races have already taken that step. So the Tour Down Under uh, use local riders and races to present the prizes. And then also Gent Wevelgem, notably last year, actually employed the services of Podium Boys mm. for the women's presentation. Uh, not necessarily a positive step, I don't think, but presumably it was an effort to seem less sexist if you use both genders in that role. Yeah, trying to balance it up, I guess. Yeah. Meanwhile, the biggest race of the year, so the Giro d'Italia, the Tour de France, and the Vuelta Espana, are all still employing the services of hostesses. Now, this is a tradition that has been going on for decades, although apparently the selection criteria has changed recently. All you needed to be before was local to the stage finish, under 30 years of age, and also about the same height, and presumably female as well. However, they are now taking into account certain key skills, such as linguistics, in their new selection criteria. Hmm. By all accounts, it is actually a demanding job. So a working day is about 12 hours long. It starts early at the race's start village. It involves serving drinks and representing sponsors. Then obviously you've got to drive the race route and then present prizes to the winners. So it is probably pretty tough going, but most of the women seem to actually enjoy it, at least they say so, and I don't think many would say they're being demeaned in any way. No. The thing is though, whilst you can argue all day that these girls probably do enjoy what they are doing, that they are intelligent, and that they could well be doing another job if they so wished, what you can't deny is the fact that it just sends out the wrong message, doesn't it? Particularly to the next generation of cyclists. Yeah, or even, in fact, the current generation of cyclists. And let's not forget that infamous occasion when Peter Sagan touched the bum of one of the podium girls at the Tour of Flanders. An incident which he profusely apologised for, but nevertheless, I think it's an indication of how podium girls are viewed amongst the professional peloton. Hmm, which just shouldn't be the case, should it? Basically, the message that is being sent across with podium girls is that women can be objectified. And it's not even as though the two powerhouses of the sport, ASO and RCS, the biggest event promoters, are actually doing very much to help women's racing, are they? No. And it doesn't even need to be a seismic shift either, does it? Race organisers 
have got three simple choices. They either keep podium girls as they are, which is not terribly forward thinking, or you get rid of podium girls altogether, or you do what someone like the Volta Valenciana has just done literally last week, and they had two smartly dressed people on the podium, one woman, one man, and they helped with local dignitaries presenting the prizes. Hmm. So, over to you cycling, it's now your move. And in fact, over to you, the great GCN viewer. Uh, as ever, we would love to hear your opinion on this topic. We know that we always get a lot of honest opinions, particularly on controversial topics such as this. Uh, so let us know what yours is in the comment section just down below. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting actually to see a snap poll as well. Yeah. So up there on screen, there should be a poll right now. Do you think podium girls should stay? Are they appropriate in this day and age? Or should they go? Yeah. Very and simple. think carefully before you vote, because actually your opinion as a GCN viewer really does count for quite a lot. I mean, who knows which people in important places might eventually see the results of this poll. So you've got an opportunity here to steer the direction of this topic. It's now time for cycling shorts. We'll start Cycling Shorts this week with some performance news. So a tweet from Cycling Science pointed us in the direction of a new scientific paper published in the journal Research Quarterly for Sport and Exercise. I can't believe I missed this. I think it's one of your favourites, isn't it? Anyway, so this paper shows that training to improve your VO2 max and your peak aerobic power is also beneficial for your power over 5 minutes, 20 minutes, and one hour durations as well. Yeah, so definitely worth everybody that hasn't checked it out already, looking at our video from last week entitled How to Increase Your VO2 Max. So basically, what the study found was that cyclists who had the best peak aerobic power also perform best, especially in the one hour time trial, which you wouldn't really expect, would you? No, that really did actually take me by surprise, that. Uh, now, sticking with science, actually, some very, very important news from a research paper undertaken here in the UK and it's actually shown that glasses, so science glasses, make you look more intelligent. That is official. Yeah. Well, maybe we should use your science glasses at all times inside because we need a lot of help in that department. Yeah, I was we? thinking that. Yeah. And I could do with something that takes a bit of attention away from the bags under my eyes. You probably need my fear and loathing in Las Vegas glasses for that mate. Now freaky news of the week now, pro rider Jan Bacalance suffered a horrific crash late last season at Il Lombardia and he did post on Instagram this week that his recovery is fortunately going well but it wasn't until he went for a bike fit that the final piece of his recovery puzzle fell into place and that was that it transpires that he's one centimetre shorter Ooh. following the fractured vertebrae that he suffered from that crash. Ouch. Scary stuff, isn't, isn't it? it just, yeah, horrible. Well, right, the world of public hire bikes is really weirdly competitive right now, and things just got even hotter due to the fact that Uber have jumped into the fray, courtesy of their new partnership with Jump E-Bikes. That's right. The first location is San Francisco, which you'll remember from an e-bike public hire front from a story actually that we talked about a few weeks back, where Ford is sponsoring the current e-public hire bike scheme in San Francisco. And then coincidentally, a major British newspaper just on Sunday was talking about how OFO, who are another public hire bike scheme, bright yellow ones that are dockless, is actually going to do to bike share what Uber has done to taxis. Presumably not counting the fact that Uber are going to try and do the same for bike shares. Yeah. I'll tell you what though, one of the first things that comes to mind is those images, or are those images, that we've seen recently of vast piles of public hire bikes laying to waste throughout yeah, China. Yeah, me too. Now last week Matt and John pointed out the positive effects of public bikes there, and that there's way more journeys being done by bikes since their introduction, but you can't help but think that they might have overestimated the demand somewhat. Yeah, you do wonder, don't you? Anyway, Moving on to racing themes now, there were, unfortunately, a couple of cases last year of amateur riders using suspicious bikes in bike races, one of which actually culminated in a car chase featuring French anti-doping hero Christophe Basson. Indeed, a man who we should hold in very high esteem because he actually was an openly clean rider who stood up to Lance Armstrong whilst, in effect, simultaneously then ending his own professional career. Yeah. The outcome, in this case anyway, was that a 43-year-old French rider has been handed a five-year ban 
for motor doping. Should be lifetime. I, I mean, so. what a plonker, or twit, as I described him as in the introduction to this video. Yep. Uh, the only thing that's positive, I think, from this... No pun intended. Yeah, uh, is that it was obvious that he was very obviously using an e-bike, which makes me think, or at least hope, that you couldn't get away with doing this in a professional peloton. Yeah. I really hope that's the case. Hmm. I think it's the case. Anyway, sticking with anti-doping for a moment, I think, Dan, it's time for our weekly Chris Froome update. Uh, nothing, actually, on the Sal Butemore case. No, is there is still no time frame for the ruling on that. However, uh, he will be doing his first race of the season next week at the Route del Sol down in Andalusia. A few people are going to be slightly awkward about that happening, I suppose. Yeah, not least the race organisers, you would think. Indeed. Right, anyway, let's leave cycling shorts on a more upbeat note, shall we? This is the cycle hoop in the shape of a car. How good is that? Parking for 10 bikes in the shape of a car. Looks like a decent sized car too. Oh, yeah, makes quite a statement, I think, Dan. How do you fancy some bike lights that never need charging? You mean like dynamo lights that run off your hub? N no even cleverer than dynamo lights. So a Russian physicist named Semyon Filipov has just designed the Arara. Named after a parrot, apparently not a mispronunciation of the northern lights. And basically, it fits onto a spoke and then as it goes round, it passes a dimium magnet, which is fitted to your chainstays or your fork blades. And then with each passing, it generates an electric current that powers the lights. I had something similar out of a cereal packet when I was young. Dan, there is no similarity between an Arara and a Spokey Doki, other no. than the fact they fit on your spoke. Right, there's a similarity for you then, isn't there? Right, there is one similarity <laughs> between that and the Spokey Doki. <laughs> right, let's move on to some great news for the group set purists amongst you, and that is the announcement from SRAM that they now have a direct mount brake caliper in their collection, which they've called the S900. Now, what this means is that you will be able to run a full SRAM group set if you own a bike which has brakes that attach with two bolts rather than just the one. It's a relief, Dan, is what it is. Yeah, for me, you can't anyway. wait, can you? I can't wait, no. It's been bothering me slightly, marginally, for a couple of years now. Yeah, on your Canyon Air Road. <laughs> That's right. Uh, now, direct mount brakes are actually great, so they can't be retrofitted to your bike, but there is a reason for specking them in the first place, in that you get better modulation, because they're stiffer, and you also get more power as well. Mm, it's a win-win situation, isn't it? It is, yeah. Right, let's move on to the new bike that we talked about in the intro. It comes from the French manufacturer, Time. It's a beautiful bike, actually, and it's called the Alpe d'Huez Ultime, or in English, the Alpe d'Huez Ultime. <laughs> it's the lightest bike that Time have ever made, and it's made from scratch, in France. Yeah, the weight they say is 840 grams for the frame, although that is a size small and it is unpainted. So it's not exactly groundbreaking. However, I think the fact that even the tubes are woven in-house is pretty cool. And that could do a lot actually for people who aren't exactly over the moon, let's say, with the way carbon manufacturing can sometimes come across as a little bit soulless. I can understand that mentality, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. No, me too. I think it's plain wrong, but I kind mm. of sympathise. Tell us what you really think, Si. Okay. Uh, elsewhere, our mates over at Trek have just informed us of their brand new Project One custom paint scheme, which they've just launched. My favourite here, Si, the Full Fade. Check this out. Ooh. Racing news now, and as you'll no doubt all be aware, we do now have a racing news show every Monday where we go into the details and results of most of the big races. But we want to focus particularly today here on the GCN show on the Cyclocross World Championships from last weekend. Yeah, mainly because it was absolutely amazing, wasn't it? One of the toughest courses in years. Gave us some truly epic racing and actually epically long races as well, which yeah. is amazing. We were treated to a battle royale, weren't we, in the women's elite oh, event yeah. uh, between Sana Khan, who of course won the event 12 months ago, and also the American Katie Compton, who has been three times in the past a silver medalist at the World Championships. Now going into the last lap, it was actually Compton who was leading and looked like she might take her first victory, but deep into the race, can't got the better of her to take her back-to-back -back World Championships. American Katie Compton, then, is now four times the runner-up. Yes. You know what they say about Santa can't, they? She can.
sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah I think we might have said that. Santa can. Yeah. Compton can't, can. Compton can't, can't, can. That's it. Yeah, nailed. Right, in the men's event, it was Wout Van Aert who somehow managed to turn the tables on the season-long dominance of his arch nemesis, Matthew van der Poel, and take his third successive title. And it wasn't just turning tables, he absolutely smashed him, didn't he? Two yeah. and a half minutes was the gap, and van der Poel actually only finished third. So what was it then? Was it Wout van Aert having an absolute stormer the day of his life, or was it van der Poel having an absolute nightmare of the day? Or maybe a bit of both. Well, you'd have to imagine it was a bit of both, wouldn't you? But was there more to it even than those three options that you've just presented? I mean, of course, Van Aert was supreme in terms of his physical performance, but he also gave a masterclass in the art of riding a cyclocross bike in the mud. He just seemed like he was on his bike, well, frankly, a lot more than anybody else. Yeah, noticeably so, wasn't it? Now, of course, he is a great bike handler, but there was also a little nugget of information that was passed to us by Simon Burney, who's like a cyclocross legend and actually was commentating on the day. And apparently, Wout van Aert had gone to visit Mr. Dugast of Dugast Tyres with his coach and mentor and former world champion, Niels Albert, because they were commissioning their very own cyclocross tyres. They asked for a 30 millimeter wide tubular. Apparently it's got a rhino tread on it, but with a new rubber compound and their flying doctor casing, which presumably is what helped him run just 1.1 bar in that. That's 15 PSI in a 30 mil tire. That's ridiculous. Isn't it just bonkers? I don't even know how he's done that. You'd pinch punch if you just sat on that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Anyway, the tyre then had to be sent immediately to the UCI to get their approval, which predictably they did am and about a bit, but thankfully for that Wout van Aert, they did finally approve it before the big day. They so did. was it the tyre then that made the difference? No. I mean, it would have made a difference, for sure. And actually, you could argue that the tyre itself helped land like a psychological blow as well, because yeah. cross riders, you know, kit, tech is pretty important, and nothing more so than tyres. And so you can imagine just cruising up to the start line and everyone's like, uh-oh, that's, you know, that could actually be quite yeah. powerful. I mean, I'm not saying that that literally knocked Matthew van der Poel's head off, but you know, still. Yeah, it's not just new equipment either, is it? Don't you remember last year when Wout van Aert rocked up with those discontinued Michelin mud tires? <laughs> that's right, yeah. Yeah, twice he's won the world's because of his tire choice. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting old topic, isn't it? The old psychological warfare and cyclocross equipment. It really is a big part of that sport. Yeah, well actually, and it, it's maybe not just the equipment as well, because people have said that the fact that Wout van Aert didn't have any pressure on his shoulders, whereas Matthew van der Poel had the entire hopes of a nation, his home nation at his home world, yeah. expecting him to win, having won 75% of all races this year, whereas van Aert was just like, eh. Yeah, so what with the expectation or lack of and the low tyre pressure, it was all about low pressure, wasn't it, for Wout van Aert? It was a low pressure cross worlds, that's right. <laughs> that's how he won it. Uh, right, before we finish with racing news, special mention to Matthew Glatzer over in Australia at the National Track Championships. Uh, he broke his own sea level one kilometre time trial record, uh, taking two tenths of a second off it. That average speed then, over 60 kilometres per hour from a standing start. Whoa. That's insane, isn't it? Um, can I have a special mention as well, actually? Go Team on. Aqua Blue landed their first uh, win of the year with Lasse Norman Hansen, which means one by, it's just one road race. Mm. That's right. Special mentions are slightly less special when there are two of them, but I'll let you have it. <laughs> it is time now for Hack forward slash bodge of the week. The first one this time around comes in from Paul Evans, who spotted this bike <laughs> on the streets of East London. I'm wondering, so whether this is the same psychological warfare against other commuters or couriers, as we've just seen with Wout Van Aert with equipment choice. Well, the only slight problem with this one is the ease with which the owner of that bike could potentially die, Dan. Uh, unlike Wout Van Aert. I've so, just uh, noticed, though, I think there is a, a lower bar option there by the stem, isn't there? So you just so I have a hit low your head on your handlebars. Or very high. Yeah, no, I'm not sure why I think about that one. Uh, this, meanwhile, is a much simpler, safer, but very neat solution as to uh, how to watch your laptop or whatever whilst you're on the turbo trainer. In this case, he's using uh, watching Zwift. So uh, this is Jeff T sent it in. It's just a bike stand with a plank of wood. Yeah. But I like it. That's yeah. a hack. Very isn't it? simple and very effective. Definitely a hack from nice there. Nice one. As is this. Oh, I, I love think you this. You would agree, one. side from Alistair Thorne. Uh, this is a newly upholstered stool in his local bike shop in Aberdeen. 
Very creative, as he points out. In a tube upholstery, this is something we don't see enough of in the world. Yeah. That is a hack yeah. right there. What else can we upholster from in a tube? Or send them in using the hashtag GCN hack. Uh, this one, uh, SP5XO, has sent in uh, an ingenious pannier solution, actually. Look at the size of those. Yeah. Enormous. You can keep all sorts in there. Yeah, well, I bet that does offer some great storage solutions to whoever owns that buy. But I can't help but wonder how he's able to pedal, because it looks like his heel would hit the container on the back there. Maybe he's got a midfoot cleat position down and his... Uh, have to be on his heel, I think. A so heel close. cleat position then, yeah. Uh, this one, this is like the tastiest hack I think we've ever had. This is uh, Finley has just sent in a picture of his birthday cake. Hmm? Look at that. That looks amazing. A yeah. bike biscuit. Does look good, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, next we have, I think, a quite ingenious solution from Lee Chung. Uh, he lost the brake cable holder while repainting his frame, so instead he decided to use some chain plates from a KMC gold chain. It looks quite neat, that, doesn't it? It does look good, yeah, and it certainly does the job, doesn't it? That's a hack from us, and a, albeit and the, temporarily. And the actually. right colour as well. Mm. Yeah, ingenious. That's the kind of hack that we like. Right, uh, Rick Taylor uh, said that he didn't want to spend $60 on a... Uh, What's that called? Spider removal tool. That's the one, a spider it. removal tool. That's what I was uh, searching for. Uh, so we made one himself, which is uh, well, enterprising, yeah. isn't it? Well, I did once make a video on how to make your own chain whip. Yeah. Cost about the same as buying a chain whip, it unfortunately. Did. Yeah. But uh, still, you can do, do your own tools, can't you? I'm sure that one was cheaper than having to buy it, so that's a hack as well. The only thing is you've got to make sure your tool is uh, a decent enough quality so you don't end up trashing your $300 cranks. So just bear that in mind. Yeah, that a word of warning. Uh, right, there we go. That brings us to the end of GCN Hack for this week. Please keep them coming in, as you do, uh, using the hashtag GCN Hack. We absolutely love going through our stash of hacks every week, don't we? Yeah, and bodies. I like them too. Yeah, to be fair, we do. Caption competition time now. Your chance to get your hands on a GCN Camelback Ooh. water bottle. Uh, we have a winner from last week's photo, which was this one. That winner is Alluvial Fan. Caption, we're lost. Can we borrow your map? <laughs> I thought that was pretty good myself. So yeah. I'll get in touch with us on Facebook with there. your address, shall I say, and we'll get that bottle to you as soon as we possibly can. Uh, this week's photo is from <laughs> last weekend's Valkenburg Cyclocross World Championships, and Sai has agreed to get us started. Yeah, well, this could almost be presented without comment, actually, but I'll, I'll do my best, Dan. The course at the Cyclocross World Championships was so scary that some people actually needed a clean pair of pants after doing a lap. Get it? Well, no, this is the second time I've heard it now, and I still don't understand it. You know, like, so scary, you needed a clean pair of, pair of clean underwear. You know? I'm tempted to say that this perhaps should be the last time that we offer our caption to begin with and just leave it to the audience, who always do pretty well. Everyone, people will get mine. Come on, you get it. Yeah. It's funny. Well, let us know if you do. And if you find it funny, probably not. Uh, leave yours just down below. Chances of winning are, well, you definitely beat me. Following on from last week's GCN show, where we discussed what is it that makes the ultimate bike ride, we thought we'd read a few of the comments that were left below that particular video. Some of you, it appears, are quite easily pleased when it comes to an iconic, epic bucket list ride. Uh, not least, Silask123, uh, my ultimate ride needs to have a coffee stop. Three, four, five coffees, of course. That was the only criteria for him or her. Yeah, not a difficult one to achieve. I Mike thought. Hall goes slightly further, saying no traffic, definitely. Okay. Uh, good weather. Tough in England. Yeah. Uh, buddies. We didn't Tough mention that, did we? We didn't mention the people that we were riding with, which is an important point because yeah. if you don't like them, it's going to be a horrible ride. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It did detract being with you actually in Gran Canaria. Anyway, uh, plenty of coffee and beer stops with the other one, so he's added an extra type of drink. Yeah, well, and then Andrew Bedford put things very succinctly, I think. Uh, he said, uh, a bike ride that makes you smile. Which again, you know, I'm not sure that's an ultimate ride. That's like most rides, I'd say. Yeah, now we discussed this uh, off air, as it were, and so I reckons that most rides make him smile, except yeah, for the cyclocross really. rated at the weekend where he really didn't do Didn't smile well. once, actually, no. no. Lots of other people did, uh, as it happened. But for me, yeah, smiling at me. as yeah. you know, I don't smile quite as much, or that much at all. 
I did smile though on that ride in Grand Canary. You did, yeah, it was a, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I went out in the New Forest the other day and, and didn't. Yeah, so maybe a criteria windy. for some. You didn't cry again, did you? No, I did go down the road that I cried on as an 18 year old, but I didn't cry this time. Oh, that's good, mate. Well, your things are progressing now, aren't they? <laughs> I might smile in another 20 years. <laughs> uh, right, let's let you know what's on the channel this week. Uh, coming up on Wednesday, we are going to let you all know how to improve your average speed. Uh, Thursday, uh, they are the best and worst bike kits of the 2018 Ooh, season. And on Friday, uh, we've got a new episode of Ask GC Anything. Yeah, and then on Sunday, we have the aforementioned bucket list ride filmed on Grand Canary, which I cannot wait for you all to see. And then Monday, Dan's back with the Racing News Show. And Tuesday, we're both back in this set. With the GCN, GCN show. show. Oh, we did that together. Maybe we're improving as well. <laughs> in another 20 years, might be all right. It's time now, as we get towards the end of the show, for Extreme Corner. And this week, well, it's quite bonkers, actually. The always impressive Robert Forsterman, he of the biggest quadriceps in cycling, uh, on his rollers, hitting his max cadence of 286 RPM. Check it out. This is in real time. That is bonkers, as yeah. you said. So I'm not even sure I could get to half that cadence. Well, it's the sense. fact that he's on rollers, so he's like, you know, it's quite hard to ride rollers, but to do it at 286 RPM, that's some impressive yeah. core, which yeah. you can see actually clearly because he's got like an eight pack and muscles coming out of every yeah. office. Yeah, I'm flummoxed as to why we can't do the same thing. Uh, anyway, if you think that was impressive, let's roll back a few years with Roller Palooza and this from Craig McClee. Three, two, one. Oh, that takes it for me, Dan. Yeah, well, I, think I don't that's think we had an official high cadence for that, did we? No, but, but you just see, faster. like it's bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Mm. Yeah, fair play to uh, Craig McLean for that one. Yeah, don't try that at home. As I'm certainly not going to. All uh, right, well, that is basically the end of this week's GCN show, isn't it? Don't forget that you can buy the same exact clothing that Si and I are representing GCN with here oh, yeah. over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, a link to which should be, hopefully, just there. Yeah, please also give this video a thumbs up. And then, also, why not check out one more video after you finish watching this one? Uh, how about that VO2 Max video that we talked about earlier on? It could help improve your VO2 Max, and then also, your one hour power. Yeah. What a bonus. Plus Should... you'll find out my lung size. <laughs> yeah. Massive. <laughs> yeah, who'd have thought it?